I was on that particular flight because it was my regular every other week flight out of LaGuardia to Charlotte, 2.45 Thursday afternoon. Uh, I work in the New York, New Jersey area with my customers and I would fly either out of Newark or LaGuardia every week. Well, we were in the air a very short time. I learned later it was about 90 seconds and I hadn't even taken out my book to read yet and I heard this terrible explosion to the left and there was a, a shuddering of the aircraft. I, I couldn't hear anything else beyond that but I did hear the engine on the left side closest to me shutting down sort of with a, a whoop, 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 whoop kind of sound and then silence and I thought to myself okay, we can go back to the airport with one engine. And a few seconds later, I realized there was no other engine, that it was totally silent, that the plane was actually descending fairly rapidly. And I looked out the left window at that point, and the pilot was banking the plane sharply to the left. And I looked out and could see the towers of the approach to the George Washington Bridge, and it was very close below us. I travel 100,000 miles a year. I play little games. How quickly can I move my flights around and get home to see my wife and four kids? So I called the travel agent at 10.30 that morning, and she put me on Flight 1549. So I, I truly believe that I was meant to be on that flight. For some reason, I was meant to be on that flight. I did not let, read that brochure. I did not know where the exit doors were, and I did not listen to the flight crew but I do every time right now. I'm very aware of what goes on a plane right now. But, you know, we sat on the runway, as people know, and about 90 seconds later after we took off, I did hear the explosion, and it was a loud explosion. I never heard anything like that on a plane before, so I did look up, and I was in 15A, so I could see, see the fire coming out from underneath the left wing. But I think where God interceded first, in my perspective, on this flight was at that moment, because it could have been a lot of panic on that plane, but. No one from our side of the plane, the left side of the plane, talked to anybody from the right side of the plane because I truly believe that if they had, they would have cross-referenced what happened. There's been a lot of panic because, as we know now, the same thing happened on the right side of the plane that happened on the left side of the plane at the same time. So I truly believe that's the moment of where it all great started because no one panicked. I was on the flight that day, January 15th, flying back to Charlotte after I'd been up to Montville, New Jersey on a business trip. I travel to the New York City area pretty much every other week. Uh, my corporate offices for Pentax Medical are in Montvale, and so I had come in from Chicago earlier in the week and spent two days in my home office, or I'm sorry, in my New Jersey office, and was just planning on jumping on the plane and flying home in time to see the dog whisper the next night and watch it with my wife. That was, my, that was the only plan I had. You know, pretty much a day like any other day. I boarded the plane. Um, there's a young lady sitting in um, 2C, and I was in 2A, which was a window seat. I passed her my briefcase and asked her if she could sit in my briefcase beneath my seat. She kind of scowled at me, picked up my briefcase, and strained because it was so heavy, and moved it into my seat. And I thought, boy, this is going to be a real fun trip. So I stowed my luggage up in the overhead and went back and sat down. And, of course, doing what every business traveler does, I was uh, answering my BlackBerry. And she was answering her BlackBerry, so fortunately we didn't have to talk very much. And then when the door closed, um, I hung my BlackBerry up and turned to her and started talking to her. Found out her name was Denise, and as we backed up, the tarmac was full of planes. And she looked out and said, wow, uh, I bet it's going to take us forever to get out of here. And I said, I'll bet you five bucks we're out of here on time. And sure enough, we were. <laughs> and so backed up, took off. Um, as we gained altitude, I was talking to Denise, and out of the corner of my eye, um, I just saw what looked like a gray blurb come shooting by the window, and it hit the engine. Um, now, I didn't see anything other than a gray blurb come shooting by the window, and then I felt it hit the engine. And when it happened, you know, I fly about 120,000, 150,000 miles a year, so I didn't I mean, I was concerned when it happened, but I figured the, the pilot would turn around and get us back to LaGuardia. And Denise looked out my window and said, what was that? I said, well, you know, I don't know what it was, but I'm sure we'll get turned around. I looked out, and when I looked out, you could see the engine out of trim, shooting flames. Um, you know, it sounded like uh, tennis shoes in a dryer. 
So uh, about that time, and I said a quick prayer. I said, you know, Lord, let's just get back to LaGuardia. Surely we will. Um, and then about that time, Captain Sullenberger made the lazy turn over the George Washington Bridge. And when he did, um, I knew we were going to crash. And I reached over and I grabbed Denise's hand and I held her hand and I said, we're going to crash. And I started to pray. Prayed for the pilot, prayed for the crew, prayed for everyone on the plane. And then I prayed for my wife that she would find happiness with somebody else. Um, perhaps not as attractive as I was. Um, and then I prayed for my kids. When you're terrified like that, I think that your brain tries to help you cope with it. Uh, in that time frame of the five minutes or so, we were going down quickly. You could see that. I could see the skyscrapers of New York City on my left just rising and rising and rising, and we were well below them. And the plane felt like it was kind of gliding, but the, you could he almost hear this whoosh of air outside of us going by. And I didn't realize exactly that we were right over the Hudson. The pilot just said, this is your captain, brace for impact. And at that point, we knew that it was not, not going to be an easy landing. They don't say that unless it's going to be unusual. But as everybody knows the story at that point in time, I mean, we were about ready to cross over the bridge. And if you ever have the opportunity to you know, talk to the Captain Sullenberger and Captain Skiles, I'll tell you, um, that was probably the moment. Yeah, because how fortunate are we to have a, a captain with 40,000, you know, 20,000 hours of flight experience, a first officer with 20,000 hours of flight experience, 40,000 hours of flight experience, plus a captain who is a certified glider expert because at that moment, he was heading straight for that bridge. He only cleared that bridge by 300 feet. And he was heading straight for that bridge. Just think if he didn't have those skills. But as soon as he got over the bridge, he said that those words braced for impact. And that's when I think everybody realized it was a pretty dire situation. Because that's the moment I actually did three things. I, I prayed. I prayed for whoever that captain was to get me down. I prayed for the last gentleman I talked to, my, my customer, to call my wife. And then I prayed to Jesus to forgive my sins because I didn't want anything between me and him at that point. I knew at that point it's probably not going to be a very good outcome. And then I reached down and I got my wallet from my briefcase and put it on me just because I, I wanted someone to know who I was because I had nothing else on me. I said, Lord, I never thought you'd take me like this. I'd done two combat tours in the Marine Corps, um, one in Desert Storm and one in a horrific um, civil war in Liberia where uh, man's brutality to man was just exemplified. And I thought, Lord, you know, I never thought you'd, you'd take me like this. I thought you would have taken me in combat, but I'm ready. You know, if, if you're ready to bring me home, I'm ready to come home. And I said, I'll see you when I get there. And then I signed off and planned on the next conversation I had with the Lord to be face to face. Um, so then we began to lose altitude and about 30 feet above the water, Captain Sullenberger said, brace for impact. Now, the whole time we're losing altitude, you can hear the cockpit noise. You can hear brace, brace, pull up, pull up, pull up. And then the, the flight attendants are yelling, brace, brace. So Denise, my seatmate, went into the brace position. And all around me, everyone was in the brace position. And um, I was looking out the window. And then I felt the Lord tell me, you know what? Not today. It's not your time. So then, when I realized that, and we're about 10 feet above the water, I'm looking for anything we might run into by then to, to help our, our situation from a survival standpoint. So we hit the water, skip once, and come to a stop. And as soon as we came to a stop, um, first thing I did is, thank you, Lord. You know, show me the next thing to do. Because um, when I'd been in combat in the Marine Corps, I always, whenever I would, would, would come to a time when I had to make a critical decision, I'd always say, well, Lord, that looks like Iraqis out there. Or, you know, should I send a recon patrol out? Um, or, Lord, we, we, those are Iraqi tanks on the horizon. You know, help guide my, my hand as I call it an airstrike. Something like that. So, again, I said, Lord, show me the right thing to do here. And, um, and my thoughts drifted to a guy named Arlen Williams um, who had, had given his life for others in a plane crash which happened in 1982. So all of a sudden I, I, 
I patted Denise on the back. I said, and she jumped up and looked at me and said, is this heaven? And I said, no, and I'm no angel. <laughs> I said, come on, we got to get moving though. When we hit the water in the back of the plane where I was, it was a very tough impact. Um, we hit hard in the back of the plane, enough to tear a hole in the bottom of the plane. I remember that the water immediately came up around my feet. There was in no time at all, and it was actually shooting little spouts of water up from the floorboards and coming in then from the back. And uh, I don't know exactly the source of all of the in, in, inflow of water, but it came in very fast. Before I got my seatbelt off, the water was up around my knees already. So I'm thinking, oh, thank God we're alive. But then I thought, oh my God, we could drown here in the back of the plane. And then I braced as well as I could because I didn't listen to the instructions, so I just braced. And about 60, 90 seconds later is when we crashed. And it was a hard crash, as people know. I mean, it was, what Doreen said, the flight attendant in the back was correct. It was a hard crash in the back. Because when, when we crashed, I went all the way up and all the way back in my seat. And people ask me all the time when I speak, how did those people get on those wings so quickly? And I tell them, I say, the reason they got on the wings so quickly is all those seats collapsed. And when they collapsed, people started walking down the seats. And when people started walking down the seats, they got out so quickly. I didn't. I actually started going towards the middle. And the water started coming up and went from ankle to knee deep pretty quick. So you couldn't see those lights they tell you about. You know, look for the lights. You couldn't see the lights. But I just waited for a second. And I waited because my mother got in my head at that point. I, my mother passed away in 1997. And when I was a kid, she used to tell all of us the same thing. If you do the right thing, God will take care of you. And she got in my head at that moment. And I just waited, just waited for a few seconds to see if everybody got out. And I was the last passenger from the back of the plane to get out. There were probably four or five last passengers out, but from the back of the plane, I was the last one out. And because when I got to the door, I went out 11F. There was no room on the wing for me. There's no room on the lifeboat. We hit the doorway uh, to come out the left, um, the left front doorway. And the rescue slide had deployed. And um, I took that first breath of air, and it was like a total rebirth when I took that cold air into my lungs. And Denise hesitated at the edge of the plane, and of course, in a gentlemanly manner, I pushed her into the raft. <laughs> and the rescue rafts have mesh bottoms in them, so they were already, the rescue raft was already full of water. Um, and then I stepped in after Denise and sank up to my waist, and as I moved, into the forward position on the raft, I looked out and there were people in the water. And I thought, man, there's no way they're gonna survive. And so I started to wave at them. I'm like, swim this way, swim this way. And the first one that swam over to me was a young lady named Pam. And Pam got to the raft and Pam's face was chalk white. Now she says to this day that she remembers asking if she could come into the raft, but I don't think she could even speak at that time. So I hooked her under her leg, pulled her into the raft, um, and then positioned her in the middle of the raft where other people could surround her with their body warmth. Um, Denise Lockie, again, my seatmate, uh, scooted up next to, to Pam to try to get her warm. And I looked over and there was a guy named Stephen O'Brien, who's a dear friend of mine now, who was swimming towards the raft. I reached over and, and pulled him in, stuck him over next to Denise, and then there was another person who swam to another corner of the raft. And I remember grabbed him by his coat. And by this time, I can't feel my hands or my fingers or anything. Grabbed him, pulled him into the raft. And he looked up at me and was shaking. And he said, this is a miracle. I said, you are exactly right, brother. And so about that time, I learned in the Marine Corps that in a disaster situation, you never stop. You always evaluate where you are what's going on, and you try to improve your situation. So making sure everybody was taken care of, making sure everybody was, um, was warm, as warm as could be, um, was my first priority. And then I started running through scenarios in my mind. What will we do if the raft goes down or if the plane starts to pull the raft down? How will we drown proof everyone? How will we stay alive until the ferries get here? And then, of course, I looked up and the ferries are on their way. 
the wings were full of people already. There wasn't any space to go out on the wings. And the flight attendants were calling, along with Sully and Jeff up at the front of the plane, were calling, come to the front, come up to the front. And when I got halfway up there, I thought, oh my gosh, there's no water in the front of the plane yet. And so I loved that idea. And you could see the sunlight kind of coming in the windows and in the front of the plane. It's a fairly significant drop down out the door into the life raft. And so the flight attendant said, just jump, you'll be OK. So I jumped, and there was probably 10 to 12 inches of frigid water in the bottom of the life raft. Nothing like those people were experiencing out on the wings. But in the bottom of the life raft, I slid in and was lying in the water on my back because other people were coming in behind me, and I couldn't really move. So finally, a gentleman sitting on the edge of the life raft helped me sit up. And from our life raft on the left front of the plane, we yelled at the first ferry boat, get those people off the wing first. I mean, most of us in that life raft were calling to tell them, please get the people off of the life raft, off of the wings first. And they did. And then another ferry boat came and helped us get out of the life raft, which, again, was not a simple task. It seemed, I know it seemed to a lot of people that we just kind of came out of the plane and got right on the ferry boats. But quite frankly, we were so frozen that most of us couldn't feel our feet. We could not use our hands, most of us. Our hands were just frozen. And thank God there were these, <laughs> I mean, these are the heroes, these guys on these ferry boats. They took most of us by the hands and just yanked us up into the ferry boat, just pure physical strength. Yeah, Sullenberger was right. I mean, they, you know, he and Skiles got us down, the passengers and crew got out, but the real heroes that day were the first responders. Because of, of, the, of, the, of the ferries weren't there in two or three minutes, none of this happens. I've talked to a lot of captains. I've flown 97 times since this. I've talked to about every captain, and I ask him the same thing. This happens where we're at, what happens? He goes, you're dead, because there's no one to save you. Uh, you could start at the tail of that plane and work your way to the nose of that plane, and you would have seen the best of mankind. You would have seen people who put themselves second, who helped others get out of the plane before they could. I think if you pull back and look at all this from the 50,000 foot mark, in, in our society, we're taught day in, day out, do whatever you, you have to do to get ahead. Make more money, buy more clothes, buy a bigger car, buy a nicer home, give your kids everything, give, 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 take, 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 and make yourself better from a material standpoint. On that day, January 15th, there was nobody, nobody looking to make themselves better materially. We were stripped down to the bare essentials. I think that we saw a great deal of the best of humanity that day. It was so impressive to me that you could look at that group of people, the rescuers, the crew, the pilots, the passengers, all of them, the best of humanity that they could muster up in this situation came out that day. After, you know, a few weeks after the crash, it was even not even that long, I think, I was trying to think of what are the lessons that I learned from this experience that I can apply to my life? Where do I need to take all of this? And I thought of the phases in my mind that day, the acceptance, the acceptance that I was going to die. I really felt that there was not a chance we were coming out of this alive. And it wasn't a, a feeling of despair. It was more an acceptance that there's an outcome here that's not going to be good. And I need to accept the fact that this might be the time that I'm going to be gone. And, and once I had that feeling of acceptance of it. It was like a calmness, kind of, that all I did then was just pray. You know, I did said some prayers to my dad, my grandpa, my mother, and um, I just wanted it not to be terrible for all of us and terrible for our families. 
but that acceptance let me go one step further so that what I feel now is that once you've been able to look at death right in the face like that, you come away with a feeling that nothing, nothing can be any worse than this. Um, and I've been able to look at my possible death here, or my probable death, and say, I'm okay with this. It might happen, and I'm okay with this. And that calmness is really wonderful feeling to have. There's a miracle on a number of different levels. Not just for me and the other passengers, but there are heroes all over the place. There's, there's miracles that are happening, and right now, miracles are happening all over, all over out of this. Just think of everything that's happened out of this, the positive, and the real message of this, knowing this book, but what happened that day is hope. When the country was not really going in a good direction, there's a lot of things not down, all of a sudden you get a hero that people can identify. You have a bunch of passengers who pulled together as a team, got resourceful, and pulled this thing off. And a group of people who weren't even supposed to be there, the first responders, who all of a sudden made their call to duty. And look how many people has touched around not only the country but the world. And that's why I think this message resonates. And that's why I speak for the Red Cross, because the Red Cross's message is hope. My life is much fuller now. Um, I say it's much fuller because things mean things to me more now. That doesn't really explain much, does it? Things mean things. Uh, things like my family. Um, when I say goodbye to my wife and hug her, I hug her as if it's the last time I'll see her. Because, quite frankly, January 15th showed me that life is so fleeting. Um, when I kiss my kids for the last time, boom, you know, it's like I'll never see them again. Um, because the truth is, you know, for, for anyone who sees this, um, we have something in common, even though we've never met, and that is that none of us are going to live forever. None of us get out of life alive. Every one of us is going to die. And the takeaway, whether you remember my name, whether you remember I was in the Marine Corps or anything about this, but the takeaway is you got to know where you're going when you die. And if you don't, then you're never going to find the peace that transcends, that passes all understanding and allows you and affords you the comfort of getting up every day and walking through this world without worry and without fear because that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm.